So hello everybody and thank you for joining. My, my name's Mark Cooper. I'm the Deputy Director for Research for the ARC Center of Excellence for Plant Success in Nature and Agriculture. And it's my pleasure to be introducing the first Talking Plant Science webinar, where we'll have Professor Charlie Messina from the University of Florida um, talking to us about his work on plant breeding for circular bioeconomy systems. And so prior to doing that, um, the introduction of Professor Messina, I'd like to do the acknowledgement of country. And uh, it's my pleasure to acknowledge country on behalf of the ARC Center of Excellence for Plant Success in Nature and Agriculture, where we acknowledge the traditional owners and their custodianship of the lands on which we meet. We pay our respects to their ancestors and their descendants who continue cultural and spiritual connections to country. And we, we recognize their valuable contributions to Australian and global society. So with that, what I'd like to do is give a little bit of brief background of Professor Messina. Um, and Professor Messina is a professor of predictive breeding in the Department of Horticultural Sciences at the University of Florida. And his new program that he's developing there focuses on the development of prediction methods for agriculture and horticulture with a strong emphasis on genome to phenome modeling uh, for prediction of properties of complex traits, improvement of crop adaptation to current and future climates, and the enablement of circularity in horticulture. So I'm sure we'll hear about all of those elements in his talk today. The program that Professor Messina runs operates in close collaboration with plant breeders to evaluate and apply uh, novel prediction methods with, within the operational um, constraints of breeding programs and simultaneously is invested in training the next generation of plant breeders. Um, prior to joining uh, University of Florida, uh, Professor Messina had a long and distinguished career in industry and during his tenure at Corteva, he made in, in really critical contributions to the development of drought tolerant maize hybrids that are now commercially grown very widely um, in the US and Brazil, so in North America and South America. And the design of nitrogen management decision support systems that are um, used by um, the industry, certainly in North America and led the initiative on circular agriculture within Corteva. So what I'd like to do before handing over to uh, Professor Messina is just remind everybody, could you please keep your microphones on mute throughout the presentation and hold your questions to the end where we'll have uh, time for everybody to be able to ask questions of Professor Messina. And um, with that introduction, it now gives, it's my great pleasure to hand over to Professor Messina. So you have to turn your microphone off mute. There you go. And you're good to go. Let's see if it works now. Thank you very much, Mark, for the invitation. Uh, it's really a pleasure to uh, share some thoughts with, with the group, uh, seeking uh, to share what I'm thinking, what I'm doing at UF, and uh, explore opportunities to collaborate. So in, in scope of that, I think uh, I will put straight uh, what uh, the research interest and kind of the program foundations. Of course, I'm not going to be the only one hopefully contributing to reimagine agriculture as a solution to climate change and human health problems. Uh, but certainly I'm looking forward to make some contribution to change the way we, we crop uh, uh, our land. More, more specific and now with narrower scope, I'm looking to develop and apply plant breeding technologies to enable that transition to a circular bioeconomy. Mark mentioned I work in close collaboration 
with breeders at UF. Uh, it is a, an, an interesting place to work. There are about uh, breeders to improve about 50 crops, including vanilla, uh, which give us uh, many opportunities to find case studies uh, within which to test ideas and partner with them and surface what are the problems and barriers we may encounter as we think about applying the, the technologies. Uh, many of these I learned working with uh, Mark Cooper with his breeding program. And finally, something really specific that stems from an invitation to speak about breeding and climate change at USAID. Uh, it became obvious after doing some homework that uh, there's a framework that is, is, I think, badly lacking, and we need one. And I think that could be a, a huge opportunity to collaborate and work with the center to provide guidance on, on how we are going to um, develop the palai methods and monitor how we should be breeding for a climate change. So what is the problem we want to uh, solve here other than inaction? And I thought this is cartoon uh, put in, in a nice way, the mammoth and gargantuan problem we are trying to uh, approach. Uh, so far, the inaction has been obvious. So we may need to think differently from a ground up to start dealing with this. Specifically, what I would like to uh, emphasize is this high throughput, high externality agriculture is not sustainable and we need to find a solution to it. Uh, it was uh, quite humbling and uh, eye-opening, uh, a report from Rockefeller Foundation uh, indicating that U.S. agriculture generates about a trillion dollars uh, worth of goods and value and about one trillion dollar cost in externalities and about $1 trillion in cost in human health associated with diabetes, cardiovascular diseases, and cancer. So uh, at the end of the day, agriculture is generating twice as many problems as the solution is providing. Of course, it's solving a very important problem, but I think we should be strained to be better. Uh, I would like to... Uh, talk through uh, uh, the grain maize example, which is I'm most familiar with, and over a hundred years of uh, selection and crop improvement, you can see the different phases of what are the products that breeders deliver. And they were essentially what society was requiring. And they were also uh, always uh, tied to the intensification of agriculture, whether it was mechanization, the increasing use of inputs like fertilizer and irrigations and only on the last about 10 years is with Mark leading the effort on Aquamax and of course I uh, will have to acknowledge the, the role of the ARC helping the, at the time pioneer develop methods that lead to the creation of those drought tolerant products tied to the use of APSIM and other technologies that we start thinking or implementing technologies that are suitable for implementing some of the circularity concepts. So how are you going to transition? What is the alternative paradigm? And here is where I think that the circularity is an alternative paradigm that can help us realize some of the ambition sustainability. Sustainability so far, it put out there what are the goals and ambitions, but it's not providing the elements on how you're going to get there. Circularity is leading by McCarthy Foundation essentially builds on industrial ecology principles that can help us think of how design waste uh, manage uh, the material cycles of mass and control energy flows. And of course, uh, unless we go against uh, uh, physics, it's not going to uh, become circular at all. So circularity is more of a concept than uh, an actual implementation of a circular. One thing that uh, it was unclear how it ties to the circular economy was some healthy diets. So you see kind of a yellow up in a corner. And to understand that, I, I put in context three of the elements of interest and how human health connect with agriculture, of course, is through productivity. So the 
if human health uh, or reduce human health, reduce productivity, agriculture uh, is uh, uh, less productive, uh, increases the throughput or use of resources, increase the greenhouse gas emissions, of course, feedback to climate change. And this cycle looped around until we can select ourselves to extinction. So it's, but it's clear to me that if we put diets at the center of this, we can interrupt this cycle by providing clear guidance to the agriculture sector, what is expected. And uh, if we go and buy steaks in sub grocery stores in, in the US, it's telling the agricultural sector is okay in agriculture with high externalities. So diet links directly the human health and agriculture. And this is where we can put a stop into this um, um, cycle that, that will take us to, to a doomed state. So essentially diets and the alternative of what else we're we going to do with agriculture in terms of bioeconomy grounded in energy and plastics is what, it, it, is what I think uh, it can provide a stop and can start driving change in the agricultural sector. And my working hypothesis then is that plant breeding, uh, emergency engineering, I will talk briefly about that. It's kind of a mouthful uh, set of words here, will help us design and create the products for enabling this reimagined agriculture. So how to transition from linearity to circularity is crop design. And this, uh, Graham Hammer was pioneer in this area. So we build uh, many on, on the concepts that he, he put forward on uh, assessing the value of the different trades as contributing to uh, performance and the various environments. What we would like to do, or what I think is necessary to do is extend that design framework, not only to the crop performance, we can measure and select for quality yield agronomics. We can understand the physiology, but in our objective function in the future in circular concept context, what I think we need to aim is not only and create products or crops that can are more productive, but with lower gas greenhouse gas emissions, with improved water quality, and enable carbon sequestration. So how you do that in a system that is essentially designed to grow experiments, conduct the phenotyping and make selection decisions that are going to be in the time frame of one to three years, at least in, in the context of maize. So one of these uh, other traits, whether it's they are difficult to, to phenotype and affordable, if you think about uh, nitrate oxides, or simply they are impossible. For example, think about carbon sequestration you can phenotype for carbon sequestration is take too long and it's incompatible with the, the time frame to make the decision. So this forces us to think differently in the terms of prediction frameworks that will be required in order to enable grow breeders to make informed decisions for the products that will enable circularity. So within that the crop design, I think what we need to start digging into some of the elements that in order to make those whether it's carbon sequestration prediction, so nitrogen losses, productivity and balance, and take the whole, con take the crop in the context of the cropping system that is going to operate, including crop sequences, we need to start process, it need to start phenotyping or design phenomic strategies that will lead us to process. Essentially think about, if you're familiar with the APSIM framework, think about how you're going to phenotype to estimate the process once we, use that sign, we exercise the model, we can start predicting how much carbon sequestration can happen, how much nitrogen is going to lose the environment and what would be the impact on yield. The engineering essentially is another area of development, development to bring to reality to those phenotyping strategies. And certainly genomics and physiologies will provide the backbone to the biostatistical machinery that we can train using artificial intelligence. The other bit for crop design, we need to start measuring success. And here I'm proposing to use the reader's equation. I'm not ready to take the differential form of this equation, but take it as an identity where we can assess whether we are succeeding in making progress, at least on the adjacent uh, cycles of selection. 
So here, what I think is important to use this identity as a way of measuring progress is also to understand the limitations to genetic gain. And here, I, I would like just to make clear the, the connection between genetic gain, heritability, and genotype by environment interactions. For those not familiar with the quantitative genetic framework, you can see that sigma square G by E on the denominator, the bigger the G by E, the lower the heritability, the lower heritability, the lower genetic progress. So uh, in a very simplified way, I would like to make that straight link between the problem we are trying to solve and the methods that we're going to build essentially is to deal with that genotype by environment interaction so we can start making faster genetic gain not only from one trait, but for multiple dimensions. And I think it was useful to run an example to, to think about G by E as depends on the physiology of the plant and the environment that are going to explore uh, without getting into the details of what is the target population of environment. If think about and read at the bottom of this slide, you have two environments, one and two around 600 millimeters. And there is this yellow trait, whatever that is, that explain most of the variation. The traits that are going to create, give the adaptation uh, or lead to improve adaptation to one variety is going to be always better than the next one. So these two environments, that distant environmental distance is pretty short. So you're not going to see any G by E. And if the target population of environment that is composed between the two of these environments, no G by E is going to happen or at least will be uh, uh, seen in your trial. Think about climate, that, that distance could be climate change if you want to think about that. The other piece is now if the environment too, uh, we think about now this yellow trait becoming uh, more evident as a silk elongation response to water deficit, the distance is a little bit higher and the silking and the improved water conditions is less relevant. So. What you're going to see is and the severe stress, the germplasm with the favorable trait, you will see a tremendous advantage relative to the germplasm with the poor uh, uh, the, the poor uh, values for the trait. Well, on this environment, let's say 1200 grams per square meter, the trait is not going to do too much. Everything, all, all the silks or the flowers will get pollinated, it will set kernels and what going to yield. So in that case, the G by E you're going to see, it belongs to this class of heterogeneous variances. In one environment, the difference will be large and the other one will be small, but this is not going to affect the selection decisions. If we push this environment a bit later, a, a bit uh, larger, now environment two of about 19 tons, uh, the trade that will confer improved adaptation to those environments that will be pretty different from the drought. In this case, think about that brown area, it will be canopy size. Uh, the, the red area is radiation light use efficiency, nitrogen in the leaves. So all the traits that will be conducive to growth and increase growth, what are going to do is lead to increased water use and have an yield penalty under water deficit conditions. So essentially what you're going to see here is a crossover interaction. And if you combine the two, poor silking uh, and uh, a big canopy, you're going to see both the lack of correlation and the crossover interaction. Essentially those, those hybrids, and Mark can testify about this, they're going to produce zero yield while the drought tolerance with smaller canopies, aggressive silking, at least in maize, they're going to yield almost 150 bushels more. So again, I think this is a nice a way to represent and think how models can help us uh, interpret the, or put in context the physiology of the plant and the environmental conditions. So in other words, what we what I'm advocating is that we need the biostatistical machinery to predict this genotype by environment interactions. And, the approach that I'm advocating to whoever want to listen is we need to leverage our scientific understanding that is encapsulating symbolic AI that stem from the 50s till recently, and the sub-symbolic AI, which is all the power of statistical learning and deep learning. So essentially, it's not one or the other. I think is the combination of both that is going to enable us to uh, 
increase, uh, make progress on um, accelerating genetic gain. So think about the, the phenotyping, how this uh, scientific, if you will, or uh, a symbolic AI look like. And I think a useful example is take this function F T for total is equal as a function Q of the detected. This is what the science make progress. We encapsulate that into simplify um, what we know about the real world that Q D for detected plus a function H, which is undetected. We don't know is there for discovery, but for so far, we can start working on what we know about part of the world. And that, part, that knowledge of a part of the world, we can encapsulate in the crop growth model. That's, that's all there is. And the important thing is this is a formal system that bring, if you will, the, the encapsulates the knowledge that has been published and developed over 50 years in a set of uh, uh, equations, mathematical equation. And more important is a cognitive model because it helps us create a graph and uh, define a topology of a network that we can leverage to start training and ask questions about what we know. So again, there's a, a cognitive model that not only put the elements, but how these, the, these elements are connected to their, how they are connected to each other and what is the directionality of the edges between the different components. So does this symbolic AI work? And this is an example that we, we did with uh, Mark for the informing decisions in the drought program where we want to know what was the response or the benefit or importance of a trade, uh, limited transpiration trade, essentially is how the stomatal conductance responds to humidity. So in this particular case, we run simulations, we group years by dry and wet years. And one of the things you see is that in regions A and B, the genotype by environment interaction you may encounter will be mostly either absent or will be heterogeneous variant. So in terms of selection for these areas, which is most of where the draw tolerant material will be targeted, essentially selecting for this particular trait or the genes that underpin that uh, expression of that trait, it was essentially straightforward for, from, from this perspective. Now, if you start want to move these hybrids to a different region like region C, you can see there's a whole different pattern of G by e emerging, which now you have crossover interactions. So this AI, symbolic AI, even though we don't have fully understand of that, is start generating the patterns uh, or emerging patterns of G by E that are useful to inform selection decisions. And indeed, we invest a, a fair amount uh, in understanding this trade. So now that we have a framework in place, at least to think about it, now we can dive into in the crop growth model as that function that encapsulates what we know. And within that will be a vector X of K that will provide the value for different genotypes that we know. And of course, there will be some others that we don't know and we want to est estimate or we don't unknown. And of course, it will be a matrix of forcings, which will be environmental inputs and agronomic inputs. So this symbolic AI encapsulates all the knowledge and think about this data generating function of what we know and the environmental forces that we uh, select to, to use. The sub-symbolic AI here I represent by this mixed model. Uh, it could be anything else, but this is a very convenient and well uh, understood uh, system of equations. And what we can do here using this sub-symbolic statistical learning statistics or regression in the very simplest of their form of sub-symbolic AI is to estimate based on market information, matrix X, and the mean of a trait, in this case, think about Y is your light use efficiency and G, which is the market effect or gene effect to estimate the value of the genotype. So how those two things, symbolic and sub-symbolic AI come together is through a likelihood function. So essentially we have a function generating data, a vector of market effects that tell us, uh, tell us the model what uh, need to run based on what is known. I put the conditional also on the uh, vector of known 
parameters because all the estimations and all the predictions we are going to estimate is also conditional about what everything else we assume is fixed. So for example, in, if we consider RUE is the only trade we are going to estimate parameters for, it could be conditional to all the other trades in that model, leaf expansion, silk elongation rates and whatnot that are fixed. So in the context of the base theorem and the uh, approximate Bayesian computation, which is what we're going to solve, you can see that uh, the posterior distribution of those market effects conditioned to the data and we assume, and what we assume as known or fixed is proportion to the constant to the likelihood plus the prior for the distribution of the market effects. And we solve that using the linear uh, mixed model. So simple ABC uh, case study, uh, I found it useful. And we run this actually in one of the classes I taught here at UF. We started with a very simple example, which is the prior distribution of model parameters. In this case was IUE. With that, uh, uh, that prior information, what we can do is take a sample of IUE, estimate the marker effect. So essentially we calculate the genomic breathing value for each of the individuals, then you can see that it fits into the data generation function that crop growth model, and we simulate multi-environment trials that generate the ZD, and based on the observation minus the simulation, we can calculate an error, essentially approximation of likelihood of what is the probability of seeing that of self data given the parameters we sample. And if the distance is slow, we keep it uh, to start building our posterior distribution. We can put other uh, metrics, if you will, Metropolis Hastings to um, navigate the landscape a little bit more efficiently. And we save the vector uh, of um, marker effect so we can start to calculate the, the mean and the distribution of each of the, the markers. So to illustrate how this work, we generate the simulate data set, assuming is the truth for different IUE, and you can see two environments here. Each of the dots is a genotype, so each genotype will perform differently into environment one and environment two. So you essentially have a little bit of map here that relates yield to the values of IUE. As a reference, if you think about the GBLAB, which essentially was going to take the average of those environments simply there's no machinery in that, bias, in that statistical approach. So it's going to predict the mean. So essentially take it this as an illustration of how this method can operate. And for, after solving for uh, the parameter of the RUE, we can see we can find the correlation of 0.85 but the important thing to note here, rather than we can recover a posterior using a strong prior, is the shrinkage that you can see based on using the lean, the mixed model approach. So the RUE, the predicted go 155 to 165, while the reality is 1.2 to 1.8. What that is going to do is going to introduce some errors. However, if you think about the rankings and the shape of that sort of map between yield and RUE, is a little bit condensed, but the shape is, is exactly the same. So again, we are underestimating the range of variation. We may um, estimate incorrectly the performance of some genotypes in some environments, but by large, you can see that the relationship between the trait and what is expected performance in different environments is being captured quite correctly. So does it work in the real world? And for this, we work with the data that was generating through the um, drought program at Corteva led by Mark. We select a data set of genotype of environment that will be the tested and we uh, evaluated on untested genotypes in untested environments, including irrigation, stress and corn belt locations. So we published this in plant physiology recently. This uh, experiment uh, included around 23 locations. Um, if I can move this. Oh, My mouse is not cooperating. 
uh, apologize for that. So what we can see, it's about 3,000 uh, hybrids in a captile uh, design. So what we can see is the accuracy difference, essentially how this biostatistical machinery uh, perform relative to a pure statistical approach that doesn't have the machinery to account for genotype by modern interaction that is increasing with the magnitude of the G by E. So in environments where the vapor transpiration is high, think about this environment, are um, all world water, if you think, and very similar to each other. The same example I showed you before, the distance between the environments, the trade perform pretty similar. So whether you choose a statistical machinery, the G by E is low or non-existent, so there's no difference between the two approaches. But when you start going from the 400, think about that the traits like the yellow trait and the brown trait, both start operating at the same time, the biostatistical machinery can capture that the same way they can recover that RUE to yield map. So now you can see the accuracy difference is, is doubling or triple in some, in some of the examples. So essentially what we found is that the increase in the genotype by environmental interaction, the more effective is this uh, combination of the capturing or using scientific understanding combination with the statistical learning. So we expand that to multiple dimensions. Now we start thinking about the, the multiple dimension in terms of the circularity. Uh, so how are you going to train these models to predict uh, in, in more than uh, just yield? We, in this particular case, the data we have was shared silk and kernels per year, but it was a, a data set from 2009 to 2014. You can see the locations all throughout the uh, Midwest and some of the areas in the Western Corn Belt, including also uh, locations in marine stress environments, include about 7,600 um, hybrids. We just got the paper accepted. And what we did here, it was to train the model using grain yield and compare the accuracy of prediction, again, this biostatistical machinery against the statistical machinery alone when you use grain yield, shed, and silk. So the panels A to D is we train the model using grain yield alone, and then we ask the question, can you can it predict shed, can predict silk, can predict kernel spray? Of course, the statistical machinery cannot do it alone simply because if there's no shed data, you cannot predict shed, but with the crop growth model, we can have that network that can borrow information. In some cases, the strength of the connections, uh, more, uh, uh, the connections are stronger for some traits than others. Therefore, you will see some shift in distribution of the accuracies uh, uh, of, of different uh, uh, um, magnitude. So take the panel A for great yield, what we can see is most of the time when you use the combination of the bias, the CGM and WGP or, or use scientific knowledge to inform prediction, you're going to do better than when you use statistics uh, machinery alone. If you're trying to predict shed using grain yield, you can see that pretty much the accuracy is, is, a, is a random sample. Sometimes it, it does good and you can see the accuracy of 0.3 and sometimes it's negative 0.3 with pretty much an average of zero. So essentially grain yield cannot predict shed. However, look at the shift. Now you look at the shift on the y-axis for the CGM WGP, how that cloud starts shifting where in some cases is even doing better than what you can do just by feeding an algorithm with um, the silk data. And what, what is doing here is the, the algorithm is borrowing information through the scientific, if you will, inform and the, top, the, the network we're getting posed to estimate the parameter. Essentially, the silk elongation uh, it depends on the water status those things get pollinated, it will set kernels and will predict yield. So essentially uh, the same way the genomic prediction borrow information through genetic relationships, here the system is borrowing information from yield to predict silk through the biological network we impose to, um, in, into the model. 
And finally, the kernels per year is even closer to yield, and you can see the average predictability is, is, is greater than zero. So now when you look at the panels E to H, now adding the information for grain yield, shed, and silk, so we have three different trades to do the, the, the model training. It doesn't add a whole lot to grain yield, but certainly the, uh, the failures are a little bit more condensed. But has a the model has no problem now finding shedding is actually significantly improving silking and somewhat improved kernels per year, which it tells us that there's a problem with the model itself that is limiting the capacity to make predictions. So let me stop there for a moment and get to a point of what can we do when you establish a framework like this. And one thing is because all the genotypes now are uh, characterized for different physiological traits, whatever those are assumed known and whatever assumed unknown and were estimated using markers, we can run and exercise that model for many combinations of weather, soil management practice and so on. And then we can use a framework that we published with Mark recently in, in crop science where we can relate grain yield to evapotranspiration, so we have a framework here to assess the different genotypes about the frequencies that the yield is attained relative to what do we expect it should be attained. That line is about the 80% quantile. Think about any points about that line is, is success from a perspective of a, a performance of a genotype. And you can see all the different points corresponds to a different combination of management environment. Of course, you can run that simulation at scale, not even measure of the transpiration, but this start providing the breather with a sense of what is, or how would be the performance of the different genotypes in a range of evapotranspiration conditions and now finding matching the target population of environment or the market environment or whatever uh, place is the breather is trying to select for uh, relative to the performance of the hybrid. So, if the breeder is selecting hybrid for a TPE of 300 to 400 millimeters, of course, hybrid two will outperform most of the time the hybrid one. If someone is, if a breeder in the country is selecting for uh, high water availability, the opposite could be true. What I think is important and now related to the, the, the bioeconomy is we can provide, if you will, a simpler dashboard, and this is water, but could be extended to carbon, nitrogen losses, and so on, in which the breather and the decision making can have an informed discussion about how we're going to relate water use in terms of food production and carbon sequestration. Think about uh, if the water is now coming from irrigation to do carbon sequestration, it could be an absurd decision to, to make. However, if that extra water is just rainfall in the central corn belt, uh, the proposition of selecting hybrid one to increase food production and increase the carbon sequestration is certainly justified. So again, the, the, the using of the crop growth models trained with genomic predictions, sorry, uh, with um, market information it enables the breeders to make decisions beyond what is just the performance and take into account things that may change over time. So now we'll go back to the problem with the crop growth model. Although the sequence of experiments was not this, I think it helped us illustrate how we can implement this iterative model building uh, as we, the scope of the program we are building. And here we can say, one hypothesis is we couldn't predict the uh, kernel numbers properly because there was a missing process in, there was a missing component in, in the model. Think about, let's hypothesize for a moment, this was silk numbers, so we can implement that phenomics as I advocated before, generate uh, simulations, think about whether the process is uh, reproducing what is intended, and then we can compare this simulation with emerging patterns and the trait associations. Here, the simulations essentially are not uh, uh, actually coming from APSIM, but it's not that we calibrated APSIM to any data set. We define what was the 
silk elongation rates or the husk length or the parameters that we put in the model based on the literature and scientific understanding and we compare with observations in published in different publications and you can see the ensemble of the lines those are the relationships that were published with different authors and how the simulated values capture the relationship between plant growth and kernel number. And there's no equation inside the crop growth model that tell the model that that is what it should do. So essentially we are, we got to a point that the scientific understanding got to uh, the capability to simulate these emerging behaviors. The hypothesis too is a bit far out there. Nonetheless, I would like to put it as a thought provoking uh, and I think I, th there's a merit uh, to, to justify, if you will, this speculation. And we walk uh, uh, with Mark and others, uh, these crops that were intended to break records, this, this enter in what a contest organized by the National Corn Growers Association to uh, let the the, the growers uh, compete for who is going to produce more yield. So these uh, are, are crops that are manicured, these that are perfectly uh, taken care of. And the last thing you expect to see is a parent plant in those canopies. So you can see it in Nebraska, might have been barrel planting agronomics, but we saw the same thing in different locations in Iowa. So one thing that uh, we can think about is that it may be the manifestation of a chaotic process that we push the system as Alfred Hubler would put is a throughput criterion beyond what the system can respond to. And this is a map of the logistic function. I'm not claiming this is the process that is generating the barrenness, but help us to think about the possibility of what may be generating these bifurcations when we push the system to uh, to move uh, energy and mass through that uh, beyond their capability. So think about on the x-axis here, think about plant density at some point is going to generate a bifurcation. If you do the thought experiment and put many, many plants in corn, you start generating a lot of barrenness and a few uh, uh, plants with uh, big ears. And then the question is, is this any evidence to uh, justify this thought and it was my mind uh, of, in our phase for a number of years. Uh, Edmund and Dana in 1979 did an experiment looking at the distribution of mass uh, at the different plant densities. So you can see at 50,000 plants there's a Gaussian distribution, very uniform. Think about in the uh, logistic map is that flat uh, line. Now you push to 100,000 plants. Uh, it's hard to tell that is by model, but they start looking like you push to 150 and the by model distribution become obvious. And if you keep pushing the distribution has to cut the axis in there because most of the plants becoming barren and it's almost like a uniform distribution here, uh, pretty much uh, reflecting that uh, chaotic area or close to it in the logistic map. So there's, I think, in my mind, some evidence that justifies the thinking about this type of generating uh, process of, of uh, barrenness due to a chaotic uh, behavior. We simulate this using agent-based models, and certainly you can generate the distributions of bimodal distributions. And more evidence, again, coming from simulation is the sensitivity to initial conditions when you start simulating breeding programs on fitness landscapes. For sake of time, I will uh, continue uh, the talk and uh, it just introduced something as emergence engineering because they keep talking about the emergence pattern, whether it is the bifurcation in the case of barrenness or the relationship between plant growth and kernel numbers or emergence of G by E patent. And if we're going to design crops and systems for circular, uh, uh, for a circular bioeconomy, all these uh, complex biological systems that we can use, so I think I propose we can use the traditional 
uh, engineering principles. So think about it, go to a list of what are the properties of agricultural systems. Obviously, we don't understand. Compare that with the traditional engineering is based on physics, right? Mechanical engineering, car. Uh, we, we understand we can engineer that because it's based on physics. When you say in biology, we need to advance that scientific understanding. I hope I convince you by using that understanding when increase predictability by simulating emergence uh, patterns of GYE. The second is we don't want uh, emerging behavior in cars and trucks, but in agriculture and system, this is the norm. And I gave you a couple of examples. The components in agricultural system have high failure rate. Definitely, we don't want high failure rates in brakes, but that's really what's happening. Think about flowers, think about the barren plant. Uh, failure is uh, an, a property of these agricultural systems. In breeding, failure is a constant. We are just selecting the top 10, throwing away uh, the 90% of the fail, if you will, uh, material that's been created. So we think about uh, in terms of emergency engineering to design and manage risk to statistically averaging and think about uh, designs based on shifting distributions and not the absolute uh, values that we are going to um, characterize as the deltas. And of course, there are systems operating in non-linear fashion uh, and adaptability. We don't want adaptive cars unless all the cars are using the same uh, type of uh, algorithm. So with that, I would like to now shift to breathing for climate change framework to finish my last uh, area of interest. And, and, and here, what I would like to do is go back to the area I know, which is the United States Corn Belt. Uh, this is a, a work we are doing recently with, with Coteva. And, hopefully will be part of the ARC Center uh, of Excellence. And what we see is the climate in the US Corn Belt has been changing for many years. These are aggregates across the whole area. This is data from, the, the, from NOAA, Meteorological Service of the United States, and it's there pretty robust. So you can see precipitation has been increasing, uh, minimum temperature has been increasing, with some oscillation and the amplitude temperature has been decreasing in a pretty linear fashion. What is important is that most of these changes occur at the same time or concurrent with 100 years of selection for uh, the Corteva maize breeding program. So we have essentially a living experiment that we can start interrogating this data about what are the consequences of breeding in a changing climate? And what are the implications for selection? So to start understanding or thinking about how we are, or the question we should be asking to begin with, here we look at genetic gain in this change in TPE. The first thing we did is over the uh, length of the breeding program, we selected hybrids that were commercialized on about 60 years. Uh, it will become obvious why we, we stopped in 1990. And each of the points in there is being a hybrid commercialized at the different, if you will, uh, dates with the changing climate. So some hybrids were commercialized, uh, I think this is the minimum temperature with, I'm sorry, amplitude with uh, high amplitude and some were commercialized with low amplitude. So the next thing, once we sort of sampled that uh, uh, set of genotypes that were selecting while the climate was changing, we selected the other set uh, from 1990 to 2020. Ideally, you would like to conduct an experiment to sample and calculate the genetic gain over all these years. And fortunately, Don Dubik and Mark was uh, visionary enough to get these experiments going. So now we have about 30 years of an experiment with the same genetics, different environment and same management. So what we can do now is taking cross sections about 
on, on each of these uh, lattice to estimate the grain yield, how it changed with years of commercialization. That big that graph on the on the upper right is for the normal density in year 2000, and we can do for all the three densities and um, for all the years, so 30 years. So then we can calculate the rate of genetic gain and we can plot that against time. And this is the, the time when, no, not the year of commercialization of the hybrid, but this is the year when the, the experiment was conducted, 1990 all the way to 2020. So here we have 30 measurements, if you will, of the rate of genetic gain at three plant populations with the same set of genotypes in the same geographical location, which is the central Iowa. And the things you can see, uh, you can see and I cannot see. Uh, the first thing is think about, let's say, assume that at the low density, everything is genetic. So you have about 2.5 gram per square meter per year. But if you manage that properly and increase the, and use the normal density as growers, they're going to use, think about this genotype by management, that genetic gain doubles. And if you think now that we are looking at the different environment as they change. Uh, we can increase that genetic gain by uh, merit of the environmental conditions. So again, you have three elements contributing to genetic gain and these are features that you can expose in the data that we have. What it has, what is absolutely clear after calculating genetic gains over 30 years of experimentation in Central Cornwell is that is positive. There's one in about 90 estimations that came close to zero. So that seems to be a pretty uh, low probability of this rate to uh, be zero. And certainly they are not negative as the uh, breeding programs operate in a changing environment. So one fundamental question we have, what I have as I was looking at that is what Grassini et al. don't understand about genetics. And this was published in PNS, arguing that climate and agronomy, not genetics, underpin recent genetic gain. Well, in my mind, there are about 30 years of data that prove them uh, wrong. So anyways, I will let that somebody else, so we figure that out, but I just want to point it out that genetic gain uh, is being greater than zero for many, many years. So we can think about two hypotheses, perhaps one very naive one, to explain the increase in genetic gain with improving climate. One is more favorable water conditions. The other one is that genetic gain increased due to the long-term adaptation to lower amplitude temperatures. So here is the result, think about the water. Uh, an experiment conducted in Beluco. If you impose water deficit, the yield is going to go down more so in the double crosses, black bars, than single crosses, yellow, uh, open bars. Baroness is going to increase in the double crosses, but not in the single crosses. The scatter grain is going to increase the same single cross, it's less than double crosses, and uh, single cross who have less uh, kernel abortion. So essentially what happened here is the environment operates in the other direction as in this experiment. So more favorable, more favorable environments contribute to higher yield, less abortion and whatnot. At the same time, genetics improve. So this could be evidence that yes, more favorable conditions can lead to an accelerated rate of genetic gain, but how much? And here is where we can uh, start quantifying uh, the increase in precipitation about 100 millimeters, which is quite a lot, and use a framework. Again, uh, we published early uh, in, in, in 2020 as part of a special issue in crop science. And we can look at if the Midwest is about 500 millimeters on average today, that should give us about 14 tons, which is what we measure in well-managed experiments. 100 extra millimeters will give us 14 and a half, maybe 15. We're talking about less than a ton, which is probably not 
one gram per square meter per year in rate of genetic gain, which can really explain what we are observing. An alternative, maybe turn into light use efficiency, and we'll see why we're going to do that, is in an experiment conducted with five years in uh, woodland and, and Chile, we demonstrate the light use efficiency increased over uh, cycles of selection with about an average of 1.5 in the 30s to 1.75 to uh, 1.9 in the 2020 hybrids. So it's about 0.3% a year, 30% in 100 years, which is massive in terms of explaining mass production and increases in yield. It's about a third of what we can think about in productivity. The other thing we know is the light use efficiency, at least the average for the location is uh, correlated with the amplitude temperature. So the uh, higher the amplitude temperature, the higher the light use efficiency. So how we can use this to think about how this uh, general plasma selection adapt to this environmental change. We can think about, uh, or looking at the evidence, the amplitude temperature decrease between one and one and a half degree. That take us about 0.25 uh, grams per megajoule which is massive. This is almost 20%, depending on, on which is the base number you use for, for the, the, the temperature and uh, the, light, the average light use efficiency. So in this particular case, what is happening is while breeders were pushing genetic, making genetic progress and adapting to that lower, uh, in, in increasingly lower uh, amplitude temperature, the environment was sort of working against. So what we can think and propose is now that the general plasm is being adapted to that lower amplitude uh, temperature, uh, the, the modern general plasm is more adapted than the old one and that can start explaining perhaps the increase in, in rate of genetic gain. So this le 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 take us to the chapter 10 from Cooper and Hammer 1996. And that's where I think we have the foundations for breathing for climate change. This is uh, a, a graph that uh, uses, uh, look at the covariance, if you will, the performance of hybrids that were selected in one set of environments to the multi-environment trials and perform in the target population of environments, if you will think about the production environment, given there was heterogeneous variance like the correlation, essentially both type of interactions uh, present in, in, uh, in that general plasma environment system. So what you can see in one end, let's say we are breeding for we select in a multi-environment trial that resembles the condition of 2050 and our environments are 2050, there's a match. You can see the covariance between selected and performance is highest. The same on the opposite side. You can see if we select and predict for the 2020, it's the same story. What we happen is if our multi-environment trial is designed to select for 2050 or climate change scenarios and our target population is 2020, we can start starving the current population to feed the future population, which is not a sensible idea. And the opposite is true. If we don't breed for climate change, we are going to starve the future population to feed the current population. So this is a kind of a Goldilocks. There's no right question here, and it has to be monitored the progress as we go so we can uh, make the right adjustments over time. The, experiment that we ran in the US Corn Belt, uh, it seems that the traits that were selected, whether it's reproductive resiliency, radiation insufficiency, were at the same, uh, the, the selection environments were correlated or, or, or were similar to the testing environments as the climate was changing. So essentially, we are somewhere on that peak uh, the question now is, as the climate continue changing, where that ball is going to end, is going to go in which of the two other directions. We certainly is not going to back to the 2020s, uh, but the question is how we are going to manage to keep that, uh, if you will, ball in that landscape oscillating at least in areas of that sort of a, a plane uh, that are acceptable to make progress towards future performance 
in future, future climates while not uh, compromising the uh, nutrition of the current population. So in summary, I think it's feasible to reimagine agriculture, but we definitely need to advance and activate predictive methods and enable the transition. And we desperately need a framework for plant breeding and for climate change to inform policy and decisions. Thank you very much, Mark. Okay, thank you very much, Charlie. Um, and uh, I think you've, we started a little bit late, but you've used up the full hour and um, really comprehensive and uh, um, thought provoking uh, presentation and a set of hypotheses that you um, inserted throughout the presentation. Um, I mean, I don't think we um, have a hard ending on this. And I know that there are a number of people who are still hanging on in the presentation. So unless our ultimate arbitrator, Phoebe Baldwin, controlling this presentation says otherwise, I'm going to allow um, those who are still here uh, to ask you any questions that they actually have. And the easiest way to do that um, would be to put your hand up and Phoebe and I will do the best um, to give you the opportunity to switch on your microphone and ask the question. And I'll leave it open for um, as long as there are, are questions coming. Of course, if I don't see any hands, we, we can wrap it up as well. OK, Tim Brodrib has a question for you, Charlie. So I can see Tim, go ahead, please. Oh, hi, Charlie. Thanks. That was a that was a really uh, fascinating talk. Um, I was just wondering, it, I don't really know much about what people are doing in terms of breeding, but it sounds like um, someone needs to be doing um, large scale trials in elevated CO2 and temperature. I mean, is, it, is anyone actually doing that? I, I, people were doing that years ago. <laughs> I almost feel like that's, that's kind of all that research has been packed up. Is it, is, do you know if that's still going on? I've been working with Lisa Ainsworth, and my sense is is minor. Uh, and I, well, you, you, I'm advocating for a science based approach, but you need that type of experiments to start uncovering the science that we feed into predictive algorithms. And, and again, I think we need that quantitative genetic framework in addition to it to guide us where we're going to go. <laughs> Uh, I think that bowling ball is it just happened to be there, but where it's going to go, it would depend on what actions we take from now on, right? Yeah, yeah, we need to build some big glass houses. Yeah. <laughs> th th thanks, Tim. Christine, you have a question. Please go ahead. Uh, yeah. Well, we're, we're having we are having to build some 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 uh, some space to to do that sort of experiments, but maybe not 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 thousands and thousands of corn plants, so. <laughs> or maize plants. That's the trouble. It's the scale, isn't it? Um, yeah, look, um, uh, my question, yeah, I really enjoyed that, Charlie. I, I was learning a lot and uh, taking lots of notes. It was excellent. Thank you so much. Um, I was just wondering with the crop growth models, just, just checking, um, how much genetic sort of genetics is there in, in the sort of state-of-the-art crop growth models in terms of the genetics that underpins physiological uh, regulation? Uh, the ones I use they are fairly linear, uh, would say rudimentary. Uh, I'm, I'm sure Mark right now is using more type of network models with a better capture of the topology and interaction of genes. Uh, so the experts are in the ARC Center of Excellence. I'm, <laughs> I'm learning from, uh, okay. from them. I, I think at the moment, the one uh, I'm using the fairly linear rudimentary, all the interactions are happening because of the physiology, yeah. right? Uh, okay, well, I, was, I guess I was just asking, um, you know, really, you know, you're coming from the state of the art where you are. So I'm just uh, checking that, that um, you know, we are in a, a great space here trying to figure out how to inc incorporate those genetic networks. Um, yeah. So it's glad to hear from you. Um, I mean, I've heard it from Mark a lot too, so um, that's that's fantastic. Thanks. 
Yeah, that that's the area I, I hope to to work with the ARC Center of Excellence uh, in horticulture. There, uh, here in the department, we have uh, outstanding biologists that they know all the networks of abortion in kernels in maize. Uh, but that knowledge needs to be embedded now in the crop growth models. Yeah, great. Thank you. Thanks, Christine. Thanks, thanks for checking up on me to make sure that I'm. Not... <laughs> Did anyone know that? Emperor, no, no, no. emperor with no clothes story. Yeah. Um, I'll, right. I'll give anybody else the opportunity to ask any questions that aren't checking up on me, please. <laughs> okay. I'm not seeing any other hands going up right There's now. There's a question in the chat, Mark. Oh, okay. There's a question in the chat. I'll open up the chat. Um, Akila um, Yapa has a question and um, admits up front it's a bit of a vague question, so I'll read it out anyway. How do you see application of biotech tools, transgenics, to these types of settings compared to conventional breeding? What role does biotechnology focusing on specific genes have, do you think? I think that's what Akila is asking. Tricky question. <laughs> Uh, I think it will depend on, on the impact of uh, the, the gene. Uh, the recent discussion with, with uh, Buckler, uh, if the trait is complex and there are multiple genes with minor effects, uh, again, I think it was what we learned a lot in, in route. Uh, transgenic is not going to give you a whole lot. It will be more trouble deregulating the transgene that you can get out of it. Uh, there are exceptions. Uh, CM28 is one exception. Uh, how many of those? Uh, maybe Argos family on the ethylene pathway, maybe another one. So I think there's an opportunity there that needs to be uh, explored and refined. So yes, there is, in my mind, there is a role, but it has there's a lot of research that need to be done how to do it effectively so uh, you don't get back down with the re regulatory costs. And an and impact, right? Uh, it, it takes time to do all the transgenic work to achieve what conventional plant breeder can achieve in, in a cycle of selection, right? So I think you need to be really wise on what network you are going to target, what process. I think it, the, the architecture, the is simple and has a more of a large effect, you probably are in a good spot. Probably you may need to think outside the realms of what is segregating other breeding population. Mark, uh, you're probably, you have lots of experience, help me out here if you want. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that's a broader discussion that, that we can have another time. I think you've answered it probably as well as we could in the time that we have. I see Graham Hammer has a question, so um, I'll hand it over to Graham. Thanks, Mark. Um, great talk, Charlie. There's a lot of a lot of stuff in there. I, I've just got a um, question about the the climate change piece and thinking about your data on that. Um, looking at the increase in minimum temperature, decrease in amplitude temperature, um, that's obviously going to connect to a decrease in VPD. And do, do you think um, there's a hydraulics connection in in this? I don't know, but I thought about it. Uh, in the humid central corn belt, it, it may be part of the, the role, could be that this uh, that humidity, right, it has a lower yield penalty, uh, increased water use efficiency in the end, right? So I think that's a worth a, it's a hypothesis to uh, explore. I think the Alex uh, model is begging to be used to look at uh, how the separate effects of temperature and respiration and uh, photosynthesis relative to the hydraulics. So I, sorry, I don't have an answer. I think my answer will be I will go run Alex model and come back to you. Fair enough, thanks. That's what we're trying to do. 
And Tim's following up. He's got another question for you, Charlie. Yeah. Oh, yeah, my ears pricked up with the mention of hydraulics. So I just, um, yeah, I was also, I was also um, looking with interest at that um, decreased amplitude, the temperature amplitude, and I, I presume that's increased nocturnal uh, temperature, and yep. and that's um, that's has a really significant effect on on the equilibration of of water potential overnight and, and so yeah i think that i think there's definitely a there's potential there for for hydraulics and and um i don't know if in in any of the models there's much of a below ground um hydraulics component is there i mean i suppose charlie and brian would have the best idea of where that sits but um is that is that currently represented um in in apsim I will let uh, Graham tell about your water potentials, but yes, the, I think there's merit to, to look into that recovery and uh, I think respiration and kernel abortion. So the plant doesn't have that sort of uh, time to recover, right? Uh, mm. It doesn't recover during the night and gets heat again during the day. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Uh, so, yeah, yeah. So those levels of nuances are not captured in most crop models at the moment, Tim. Oh, that's good to hear. There's more stuff to do. <laughs> so, so the interesting thing is that um, with the ongoing work that Charlie sort of introduced that, that we're doing on this long-term genetic gain experiment where we can actually estimate genetic gain with... Um, sort of design sets of hybrids from the, we can go back to the 1970s actually all the way through to the present um, we were actually looking at the change in that amplitude and looking at the impact of the lack of recovery overnight and and that does feature quite heavily in the way that the managed environments were designed that were used to underpin the breeding programs so that we could actually separate out stations where we knew there was limited recovery and other stations where there was a higher level of recovery overnight as part of the water deficit challenging environment. So, you know, we don't have the machinery embedded inside the crop growth model for the predictions that Charlie was talking about, but all the evidence is pointing that in combination with some of the other traits that we're looking at, that that may be an area where we're trying to capture that with the genomic prediction beyond the model, but we could actually explicitly put that in the model. And I think some of the work that Sean Gleason and others have started to show with the trees model probably sort of gives us a good entry point for um, a more comprehensive investigation of how to put those hyd hydraulics in to deal with the, um, what these data are revealing, Tim and Graham. Yeah, that, well, that's great. <laughs> I think that's it. Yeah, the, the, the trick is actually um, yeah, trying to actually monitor that stuff. But we'd be great to talk to you guys a bit more about that because we've got some uh, yeah, interesting data with regard to that too. So yeah, great that we're all collaborating. Yeah, I, I can stay late at night if you wanna <laughs> let me yeah. let me discuss the, the ideas. <laughs> well, I'm, I might send you a. a um, yeah, an, an email with, with some data or something, Charlie. It'd be, it'd be very, it'd be good to to talk more about that. Thanks. Okay, I think we've gone fifteen minutes past the hour, or just a bit more, and really, really good questions and sort of teasing apart some of the really interesting information that that Charlie has shared with us. And and I I think that I'll probably bring it to a close at this point. I think um, the one thing I do is, first of all, thank Charlie for um, really um, pulling together a lot of ideas in a way to present them as, as our inaugural um, Talking Plant Science webinar. I, I think it was a very appropriate talk. And also just to um, remind everybody that Charlie has right from the inception of the um, idea of the Center of Excellence has been a strong supporter and was really instrumental in 
um, bringing Corteva on board as one of our core partner organizations. And even since moving to the University of Florida has continued um, his uh, um, connection with us as an associate investigator and continues in collaborating on a number of projects he started in Corteva, as well as um, looking at additional opportunities to build on that while he's broadening his thinking at um, the University of Florida in terms of climate change, circular agriculture. So I think that great opportunities and um, a great ambassador for us. And I thank him for everything he's done for the center and plans to continue to do. And so um, I'll close it there. And on behalf of everybody, say thank you very much, Charlie. And um, thank you everybody for joining us for the first Talking Plant Science webinar. Congratulations, everybody.